before I begin what will likely be a 12-part series on Gibbyup, I'd like to clear up some nomenclature. Clown and clone are not the same thing. Clown is a North Germanic word. It was originally a derogatory term for a clumsy peasant. Clowns as we know them today begin with Joseph Grimaldi, a depressed alcoholic who reimagined the clown character as a zany comic relief. Look at that zaniness. As a result, the word clown instead describes a range of talented slapstick performers. They're usually associated with circuses, birthday parties, childhood obesity, and a really, really terrible PR department. Clone, however, is different. It ultimately comes from the same word, but the word clone describes a reclusive humanoid species found in rural Siberia, as well as Georgia, France, and other countries. There are private people who spend most of their time in subterranean cities to avoid harsh winters. While reclusive, they aren't entirely isolated. In fact, they're world-renowned for their expressive clothing and makeup, their fatty pies and cheeses, their downright bizarre whistled language, and most of all, their clowning festivals, which are basically rap battles, government policy debates, cooperative dances, and therapy all rolled in together. Now, needless to say, costume, painted people who eat pies, make jokes, and speak in silly sound effects sound awfully similar to clowns. And there is a lot of overlap, but they really aren't the same thing. Clown doesn't have to be clone, and clone don't have to be clowns. But the fact remains, they are really similar. No one knows why, but the prevailing hypothesis is that Joseph Grimaldi, the father of clowns, was clone. Aside from his private journals that attest to the fact, you can easily see the clone influences in his original costume designs. It also explains why clone don't use big shoes, giant lips, and afros, since those costume elements weren't added until the Reconstruction era, when racist minstrel show performers invented hobo clown makeup so they could pretend that their old acts and routines weren't racist anymore. The fact that clone exhibit Grimaldi-esque influences, but not McIntyre and Heath influences, suggests that clown and clone aesthetic split somewhere in the late 18th century Europe, at the latest. This doesn't tell us how jesters fit in the equation, but I don't know the answer. Besides, this series is on clone, not clowns. For more on clowns, check out Paul Boysack's It's the Semiotics of Clowns and Clowning. Or if you prefer videos, look at National Geographic's Clown Showcase, one of Dainty Funk's clown videos for information about how they relate to minstrel shows, or Roxanne Swenzel's art for an indigenous perspective. Although they're not exact parallels, still really interesting, links in the description. That's it for the clown department. Instead, this series is going to focus on the clone people and the major culture Kip Beep and its elaborate language, which is gonna take like nine videos to cover on its own. Next time, I'll go into the biology of the clone people, at least where it pertains to their culture, such as their love of bold colors and affinity for expressive, sun-protective makeup. But it also sheds light on quintessential clown characteristics that have otherwise evaded explanation. You're not going to want to miss this, so you'd better subscribe and hit the notification bell for updates. And if you want to say in what videos I make, or if you want a sneak peek in the process, check out the Babble Lab Discord server. I have a 138-page grammar of Gip Gip uploaded there for your reading pleasure, and the community gives me great feedback that can influence my next video. Thank you for watching. Enjoy having language.